56. These are the survivors, waiting their turn to be spawned at Fish and Game's Eagle Hatchery. Remember last summer when Idaho's endangered sockeye salmon were in hot water? The drought and unusually warm weather had conspired to raise temperatures in the Columbia River system, killing tens of thousands of the migrating fish. Biologists fear that those sockeye bound for the Stanley Basin in Idaho may not complete the last part of the journey, and so emergency measures were taken. We drove to Lower Granite Dam to their trapping facility there and, and collected sa uh, sockeye salmon that were coming up at that point and brought 51 of those fish back to the hatchery here um, just to ensure that we had some of the anadromous fish back. Eventually, 56 more sockeye did make it here to the Redfish Lake Trap in the Stanley Basin. Not a stellar year for this endangered species, but a far cry from 1992, when only one sockeye returned from the ocean, the now famous Lonesome Larry. It's come a long way since Lonesome Larry for sure, but that's the reason we have the captive broodstock, is to, to protect us against situations like that where we don't get a lot of, a lot of anatomous fish come back. In a separate building, away from the bright red heroes that made the round trip journey to the ocean, is the safety net for the sockeye program. The captive broodstock, smaller and much duller than their traveling counterparts, these sockeye spend their whole life in one hatchery or another. Idaho sockeye salmon were listed as endangered in November 1991 after a dismal decline. Scientists estimate that only 62 adults returned to the Stanley Basin in the years between 1985 and 1990, and it got worse. In 1992, only Larry showed up, a sole survivor. But by that time, the captive broodstock program had kicked in, and all these fish here today can trace their heritage back to Larry and the trickle of sockeye that returned to the Stanley Basin in the lean years of the 1990s. Well, one of the, the big things early on with such a small broodstock to start with, we didn't want to have any inbreeding in the program or you wanted to try to minimize that as much as possible. So it was important that, you know, through early in the program, we built pedigrees trying to track individual rearing groups and make the, the best crosses we could possibly make. And now that the numbers are up, Baker says the rigid genetic monitoring has relaxed a little bit. This year, 390 captive females will be spawned, along with 40 females that made the ocean journey. 49.46. But still, every bag of fertilized eggs is marked with a code, indicating the female and male lineage. And then the progeny are tracked throughout incubation and rearing until they reach adulthood. Keep the subfamilies isolated and we just have them color coded, red, white, blue, and yellow. Once the eggs eye up, that's what they call it when they develop a black dot that indicates the pupil of the fish, the eggs will be robust enough for shipping. The eyed eggs will travel to Fish and Game's newest facility, Springfield Hatchery, which was built in 2013 exclusively to raise sockeye salmon. And although this past summer's hot weather and low water affected the sockeye returns, the summer of 2014 showed how well this program is working. 1,500 adult sockeye salmon came back from the ocean to the Stanley Basin, the highest return number since the 1950s. It was a banner year for the endangered fish, but also a milestone for the biologists working to recover the sockeye. In time, maybe Redfish Lake will once again live up to its name. I enjoy being part of this program and, and trying to get the numbers to, to recover a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's interesting from year to year because you, you don't know what to expect or what Mother Nature might throw at you, but you know, it's been a challenging program and I've had a lot of fun working with these fish and seeing the numbers you know, increase.